Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this, the second uh, webinar in our national, in the National Forum's webinar series, but our first webinar that's dealing with the topic of the Agile curriculum. Um, can I thank everybody for their attendance? We've had a, a really good um, a registration for this. It's obviously a topic that's really of, of interest to a, a lot of the sector. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our chair for the day, uh, Dr. Jim Murray uh, from FIA, and uh, Jim is also a board member from the National Forum. So Jim, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Terry. And again, just to reiterate a uh, warm welcome to everyone that's attending today and thank you for doing so. Um, today's topic is a very interesting one. Uh, it's, it's a two word topic, agile and curriculum. Uh, and they're words that I think are replete with meaning. And I suppose the purpose of today is to try and work towards developing a shared understanding uh, around this whole area of the agile curriculum. Uh, it's a fairly packed uh, hour that we have ahead. So I'm not going to uh, speak very, very much. My main role today will be to, to keep things moving. Uh, but just to outline very briefly what we intend to do. Uh, Dr. Claire uh, Vinia will be uh, doing a, 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 a scene setting and, and context for us just so that we get a, a broad understanding of what we're talking about. And then we're going to have four uh, lightning talks from the project leads of a number of HCI Pillar 3 projects. Uh, I'll introduce the, the speakers uh, as we come th towards them. And similarly too for the uh, third item on the agenda, perspectives from employers. Panel will come together then at the end and we'll have a discussion. Uh, so um, we might just move on then to the, the next slide. Uh, the webinar has been recorded as, uh, uh, to support this discussion um, and, 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 and the notion of, of, of uh, we, uh, the Agile curriculum. And we will have a, a publication on that coming from the forum. We very much welcome comments and questions via chat throughout the webinar and you know all the responses and ideas that you can think of we will uh, we will welcome them with open arms and we look forward to a very engaged webinar so uh <coughs> sprightly chair here moving on uh and and i would like now to introduce dr claire mcvinia from the national forum who is going to do some scene setting for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, and welcome to everybody. And as Jim has said, we will really welcome your responses and your perspectives on this topic today. I'm just very briefly going to uh, give you a little sense of where this has come from and, and the work of the forum is coming from in relation to the, the webinar today. We know that it's very difficult to define curriculum in higher education, other parts of the education sector uh, for example, at school level, might have a set curriculum or a national curriculum that we hear about, but it's much more complex for us in higher education. And this has been well discussed and debated in the literature over many years, both in Ireland and internationally. Um, but there is consensus nonetheless that curriculum is no longer just the syllabus or content or subject matter of our disciplines. Um, and a sense that it is dynamic. We have the text from some years back edited by J uh, Jean Hughes and Eloise Tan called the dynamic curriculum. We've heard a lot about the connected curriculum from work in the UK that's been influential in Ireland in recent times. We've heard a discussion of a co-created curriculum with students and that's been at the heart of a lot of work in TU Dublin recently. I'm thinking also about sustainability now in the curriculum. And um, since the pivot to online, we're more and more hearing about learning design as, as an essential part of curriculum as well. So all of these terms have been very important in our evolving thinking about curriculum. And it's also been the focus of intensive work across the sector in recent years. This slide is by no means representative at all. It's purely cherry picking a couple of projects people will be familiar with in the sector. We know the connected curriculum uh, has been picked up and used in UCC, for example. We've seen the Trinity Education Project uh, over the past number of years. Colleagues in the sector are partners or will have engaged with the ABC Learning Design Project. Um, and that's been particularly important since the, the, the campus closures with the emphasis on remote teaching and online. 
So there's a lot of momentum here for us. And um, we have this key question that we're addressing in the seminar today in the webinar. Why is it important to develop an understanding of what we mean by an agile curriculum at this time? Um, so the HEA Human Capital Initiative Pillar 3, Innovation and Agility, has seen a substantial investment in this area, some 197 million euro over the period taking us up to 2024. We have 22 large scale collaborative projects which have been funded across the sector and we're very fortunate to have the leads of four of those projects with us here today and we'll be having subsequent uh, projects featuring in the June webinar. And agility has become an increasingly prominent concept and we see this in other fields that you're no doubt familiar with uh, those of you participating here today, for example in project management or in software development or in e-learning and I'm sure you can think of many others where we, we talk about agile responses, agile development. However, we don't have that shared understanding of an agile curriculum in higher education just yet. It's emergent and it's something that we can look towards now, uh, starting with, with uh, conversations like the one we have today. And just to pick a few points from the original HCI Pillar 3 call that speak to this, you know, we're thinking about innovative methods of teaching and delivery benefiting the learners, the focus being on lifelong learning, on responses to changes in technology and enterprise and in the social setting in the community and what we need to do nationally to provide lifelong learning and upskilling opportunities. And when this call appeared, we didn't know about the pandemic, but the pandemic has thrown it all into even sharper relief as something that we need to, to consider. So that's just to, to give a flavour of the, the thinking around this um, as it has influenced the projects and our thinking leading into today. We'd really like to hear your ideas in the course of today. So we have set up an open Google document for people to contribute to uh, throughout the webinar. And we have two prompts. In this part of the webinar, we'd like to encourage you to respond to the first prompt, which is just highlighted on screen here. What do you think are the key features inherent yeah in the Agile curriculum. And then later in the webinar, we will come to the second prompt on the slide here. So I think Terry has posted the link through to the chat uh, for you to access there now. And at this point, I'm going to hand back to Jim and we'll move to hear from our speakers. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, so our, our four speakers today, we're very fortunate to have them. Uh, we have Professor Anne Ledwith from the University of Limerick, who's going to talk about the UL at Work project. We also have Professor Denise Rooney from Maynooth University, who will talk about the virtual laboratories in higher education. Dr. Len Ramsey from the Irish Universities Association so is, is going to uh, talk about the multi-campus micro-credentials project. And finally, Dr. Deirdre Lillis from TU Dublin, who will talk about the Convene project. So again, with the sprightly moving on, I'd like to call upon Anne to, uh, to uh, give her first presentation. Thank you. Um, so I'll work, I know it's only five minutes, I'll work very quickly through this. So the, um, I suppose the overarching theme of our UL, our UL at Work proposal was to work very closely with industry to develop a suite of flexible programmes for um, industry 4.0 skills or, and digital skills, data, um, AI, machine learning, that whole realm of kind of jobs for the future. Um, one of the things that we were, you know, th th there were a couple of, I suppose, innovative about what we were defining as the unique elements of our program. One was the level of collaboration that we were planning and are in fact having very deep level of collaboration with industry, both in program developing and defining what programs we're going to develop um, and also in delivery. And that, that's something that we have done in, in patches across UL for the last number of years, but we're going to formalize it as part of this project. So it will be a very deep learning, a deep um, collaboration with industry. And I think in these areas, it's particularly interesting. I know we're involved in a couple of EU projects looking at AI and machine learning. And one of the, the problems that's been posed across Europe is the fact that industry is ahead of academia in a lot of these areas. So how do we teach graduates? If, if we're not even at where they need to be to be in the workplace. So that's one of the things that we will be, one of the issues and problems we will be addressing. Um, the second thing we want to do is to increase our flexibility so that like, like other institutions, we all have long processes for accrediting programs and they make a lot of sense. It means we do things right. We do things in time for the CAO, in time for our recruitment cycles. 
but those same cycles are not always the cycles that we need when we're when we're working with industry and we're upskilling with industry so we want more flexibility that will allow us to move more quickly and that will be achieved to a large extent by by learning blocks by breaking our learning down into smaller blocks and that's one of the things that we're working on now to set up the whole project so that we can start to reuse almost like lego blocks to build different types of programs and bring in different flavors and bring in different topics um, we will also be looking at that as much more a, a kind of an open structure so that we will be working with other content providers as well to bring them into our programs and our roles. And I think this is something that we're seeing across the board or your roles as educators are moving from being content providers almost to, to scaffolding and curating courses and bringing courses together. So that's part of the kind of the one of the themes that we want to see within UL at work. Um, the other thing that we're doing, and I'll talk about it a little bit more on the next slide, are these unique challenge based degrees, and those are very exploratory. So I'll just move on to my next slide. Um, you'll have seen in the media that UL has just released these immersive software engineering degrees, which are looking at a totally different way of learning. And um, it was interesting in the university and that there were two parallel paths. There was the conversation around the immersive software engineering and we were working on our UL at work proposal. We touched at some point close to the end, but we had actually arrived in a very similar place working in parallel. Um, so the idea of these is that they're going to be accelerated undergraduate degree programs. We have working titles. Again, it will be in consultation with industry that we will actually fully define those titles. But the features are going to be different. The programs will not work on our standard 12 week work learning blocks of, or 15 week semester where students go to lectures and you know, take a whole pile of different modules. We're looking at a much more integrated approach to education, integrated with industry and in integrated throughout the curriculum. We will be asking more of our students. So the notion that you go to college to spend half your time on a summer job or a part time job or in, 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 in the pub is, is going to be different. So we're looking for a different type of student and a different type of learning. Um, and we are hoping that the final year of this program will be spent in industry, but continuing to learn while you're in industry. So that, that's the, the overall structure of the programs. Those are still under development. I can't say any more about those. We'll work on top of degrees, which will be very close collaboration with companies. We've done this kind of stuff before. And one of the key features of those top of degrees is that we will work to develop content based specifically on the needs of companies. And I think Again, with changing roles of university, this is something that we're going to have to look at. We don't own all the content. We're not going to own all the content moving forward. Um, I think that's okay. So the, immediately, the, the first to the front end, kind of the front loaded part of the project, is our new professional diplomas. So we have a suite of seven new professional diplomas that will start in September and a digital futures masters. So we're, we're building those as we speak. Um, they're in areas that we've identified through consultation with industry, we will be developing, delivering them with industry. And those professional diplomas, again, will become building blocks of the, the master's um, programs that will be for full-time for full-time students. One of the challenges to us is how to integrate those two groups of learners. And that, again, is something that we hope to, to work on and move forward on throughout the duration of this project. So I think that's really all I have to say. Hope that was within my five minutes. Thank you very much, Anne. That was great <laughs> and, and definitely stuck to the five minutes. I'd like to call on Denise now to, to make her contribution. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll try and share my screen. Um, thank you again. And I'm very pleased to be telling you about our HCI project um, to integrate virtual laboratories in an experimental science. So I think what's quite exciting about our project is we have five partners working on it. So we have five partner institutions um, across um, Ireland. And I think that gives us a curriculum advantage. And the first advantage that I can see from that is the scale. We can work with a larger number and diversity of students than any one institution could do alone. The second thing that I think is an advantage in terms of curriculum is that we are working together in partnership. We are sharing our ideas, we're sharing our experiences. So we should end up with something that is better than if one institution was working in isolation. And I think that's a really nice feature of our project. Um, additional factor of our project is that we also have enterprise uh, stakeholders. We're working in the chemical sciences, and as, as many of you know, the chemical sciences it, um, it has a very big industry in Ireland, so we're very fortunate in that regard. 
and our partners are going to work with us to help us design our curriculum, where they're going to give us feedback as we go through the project. They're going to work with our students through seminar series and site visits. This is going well. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. Always works better in practice than in reality. <laughs> That's why you need the virtual. Um, so what is a virtual laboratory? A virtual laboratory is a, a simulated learning environment um, which allows students to either carry out in a laboratory experiment online or to study the concepts and theories associated with an experiment outside the physical laboratory space. So why would you want to do that in an experimental science? What is the educational advantage of that? Well, I just want to highlight a few of these to you. The first thing I would say is that the physical laboratory um, experience can be very overwhelming for students in which they have to learn a lot of things in a short period of time. Whereas if you can reinforce that with um, them carrying out the experimental techniques virtually, they can come to the laboratory more confident in their skill set um, and more uh, willing to, to, or more confident to learn in that environment and let, with less cognitive overload. The second thing that you might think about if you're not doing it for experimental sciences, that undergraduate experiments are designed so that they do not fail. We don't have the luxury in terms of time and resources to allow failure to take place. And that means it's not really like a real science experience. Whereas in the virtual world, you have um, the resources to let the experiment not work, to have the student repeat the experiment and to have to problem, skill, um, uh, problem solve through the experiment. So they're learning a different skill set. The third thing I think that's very important is when you remove the necessity to come to a lab at a certain time, at a certain uh, place, you are allowing flexibility in access to the experimental science education. And you can see that that could be of real advantage for our lifelong learners. So then you get to the hard part, which is your implementation, which is what we're talking about today, which is our design um, implementation and assessment of our student learning. And we think we are doing that in a, a very considered agile way. So the first thing that we are doing is we are piloting this with a small cohort of students in each um, institution. Um, we're getting feedback from all our partners on the programme, our enterprise holders, our, our staff and our students at each stage. We're in the moment are taking up our baseline surveys from our students to get a feeling for their experience of laboratories and what they are learning from them to inform what we do in our design of our curriculum. Then we're going to refine our curriculum as we go through the years, as we roll it out with larger numbers, so that each year it's adaptive and flexible and we will be improving. The third thing that we are concerned about, and I think everyone was concerned about, is, is assessment. Um, we are considering how we are going to carefully assess our programme, that we are actually improving the learning of our students. So, um, that is a very important consideration in any Agile curriculum. So the other thing I would say, if you're thinking about um, developing curriculum and, and doing this in a, a really well-designed way is to keep an eye on what are your outputs. So our goals of our programme are to um, help our first years and second years in their learning by uh, reinforcing um, there are chemical techniques with this blended approach of um, in situ learning in the laboratory and um, doing those labs or related labs outside the laboratory so they can reinforce their skill sets or they can work as um, uh, take this skill that they learned in the lab and, and um, then do a simulation to see how uh, a chemist working in a hospital or an environmental lab would use the same technique to solve a real world problem. And so they learn the, the significance of the techniques that we are teaching them. With our third year and fourth year and master students, we are going to work 
with uh, get industry relevant pr um, problems for them to solve uh, with partnership from our enterprise partners. We're going to get them to do that in a virtual way so that they can be problem solving and troubleshooting through this uh, industry relevant problem and they can develop their team working skills. So we are hoping to, uh, our, well, our goal of this project is to have more work ready graduates. A final goal of our um, project is to have um, better links with industry um, in order to train our students so they have a better understanding of how we're training them. We have a better understanding from them what they need from our graduates to uh, train the graduates of the future. So hopefully, um, I know there's uh, no more time today, but that's my email address. And if people are interested in asking me any more about the project, um, I'm very happy to take um, any uh, emails from people. Thank you. Okay, I'll stop swimming. Thank you very much, Denise. Um, it, it's clear from the two speakers that we've had so far that uh, the, the tests of flexibility, innovation, so forth are, are, are very much being met by, by, by these projects. Uh, it's very exciting to think of concepts like unique challenge degrees and simulated learning environments to the extent that we are now thinking about them. Uh, so uh, anyway, I won't say any more. Um, we, we, we leave that to the discussion later. But I'd like to call now upon uh, Lynn Ramsey uh, from the IUA to talk about the uh, IUA's micro-credentials project. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. And good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to be here. I'll share my screen with you now. I've just a few slides to give you a sense of the project and our ambition from the, the project. Everyone see that okay? Yeah, great. So this is the multi-campus micro-credentials project um, and the IUA are leading this on behalf of the seven universities. So it's working across all seven of the Irish University Association universities um, and across a wide range of disciplines and enterprise areas. And um, so there's a real diversity in this project and it's a, an ambitious project and, and one for which we have, in essence, we have um, four elements in the, the multi-campus micro-credentials project. The first is to develop a, a framework of multi-campus micro-credentials for um, all seven partner institutions. And, and that talks to uh, a commonality in terms of nomenclature, in terms of definition of micro-credentials, and uh, looks at the range of the credit base for the micro-credentials and also looks to how the, pre the credentials would be delivered, uh, whether it's on site, uh, in a work environment, blended uh, or fully online, might depend entirely on the, the needs of the learner, the relevancy of the discipline, um, or indeed uh, the demands of, of enterprise at any given time. Uh, the second element, um, and one of the elements which is, I'd say is in common with all of the HCIs uh, which have been awarded, is uh, rethinking the nature of the enterprise engagement. Um, the enterprise engagement is supported for the, in the project by an enterprise advisory group, and we have four members of the enterprise advisory group, but the, the thinking is to reimagine what a dynamic, sustainable model of enterprise eng engagement would look like looking beyond that which is there in terms of data currently and looking again at the models of how we engage with enterprise. So whilst our established large multinationals might have that piece really well thought out and have a mechanism for doing that, that's not the case for a lot of our indigenous industry. Um, and we want to reimagine that in a, a very different way. And there's very interesting models in private industry and we're keen to learn and, and share for that and work with all our partners across the entire sector in those conversations. The third element then is to develop a really uh, sophisticated communications piece around micro-credentials. Um, what we're talking really here is about a culture change and how learners engage and how we engage with learners and how we engage with enterprise and how we engage with social partners. So whilst the development of a portal as a, a shop window, if you like, for the micro-credentials is one of the key features, it's thinking beyond that portal and thinking, I suppose, what that portal looks like in a very engaged and understandable way. And um, if we're working with different groups of learners and working with learners in a lifelong learning space, what does that upskilling, reskilling look like? What does the learner journey look like? 
what are the learner personas with whom we're engaging because it'd be quite different from a normal undergraduate student so that challenge around thinking about the cultural change of lifelong learning and then how you communicate in a dynamic way and um, because there is no point in us developing a suite of micro credentials which look fabulous but no one wants to engage with at the end of so that relationship with the learners and wider stakeholders and the communication piece i think we need to think about that differently but one of our outputs will be a portal but that's not the end of the communications piece um, and then the final element is within each of the universities there is a project lead who works right across that uh, university developing a suite of micro credentials um, and as i said at the very beginning those will look and feel different depending on the specialisms but depending on the the priority pieces for for the university so they're ranging from fintech through to humanities through enterprise through to engineering and uh, in the professional bodies um, which is a really exciting range of learning and a range of possibilities and also then different learners and different ways about uh, engaging with the professional bodies um, and, and enterprise so those are the four key deliverables uh, and i thought uh, about terry's and claire's mandate to us to think about agility and innovation and, and what that means particularly for our project because the projects are about the big ideas aren't they they're about what we leave at the end of it all um, and i think for us that piece about reimagining lifelong learning is foregrounding a lot of our thinking so we understand uh, the learner to be a different concept so we need to drill down into that we're thinking about what flexibility means in terms of program uh, development so obviously shorter pieces and in some cases maybe very short pieces which are developed quickly in response to enterprise needs or a societal requirement um, but also delivered differently. So not at a time that suits us in aligning with core semester times. Uh, we're thinking over weekends and evenings and we're thinking online and blended and on site and on campus, whenever that might happen again. Uh, and, and all combinations of those. So it's thinking about what would be the models that would work well um, for all of those groups. So I think reimagining the learner, reimagining the engagement, and reimagining how we do things in a positively disruptive way. So apologies for the uh, PowerPoint, uh, but hopefully that's given you a sense of, of our thinking um, in this space of multi campus micro credentials. And we're really looking forward to working with colleagues right across the sector. Uh, we know that micro credentials are a part of at least 15 of the, the HCIs. So our plan is to work uh, collaboratively with colleagues right across the sector. Thanks very much, Jim. Thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, again, very exciting uh, to see what's, what's coming through. I mean, we, you know, Anne, Anne mentions the cycles for industry and the need to re be responsive. And then again, you've picked up that theme with, you know, speed of development, which is, uh, I suppose, something that we're, we're not famous for in HE and maybe in the, in the past, but uh, I, I, I certainly sense there's a big change afoot. Uh, so our, the, the final speaker from the uh, HCI session is uh, Dr. Deirdre Lillis from TU Dublin. So Deirdre, I call on you now. Thanks. Sure. Um, I'm a head of computer science in a day job, so um, I guarantee the technology is going to let me down, let's say. But um, uh, just thanks to everybody. Um, thanks to Claire and the National Forum for the, the opportunity to present today. Um, Convene, it, it's a new way of working. It's, it's aiming to transform um, university enterprise engagement in that co-created skills and innovation ecosystem. It's picking up on, on Lynn's point, I think, about how we work with enterprise. Um, it's a partnership between TU Dublin and the UCD Innovation Academy with 36 enterprise partners from seven economic sectors, um, working from tourism to pharma to ICT to creative and cultural. Um, so a wide, wide spectrum. Um, there are two mind shifts I think needed in Convene and, and two really in terms of how higher education works with enterprise. The first is it's not about us. Uh, we've got to get out of that, that mindset. It's not about what we want to do. It's about what enterprise needs. Enterprise will tell you they want a cup of coffee and a quick solution, but what they actually need is, is a longer term partnership for talent and innovation. The second mind shift really is to recognize that we don't have all the answers in higher education. Um, there's a massive untapped 
talent pool in enterprise itself for its own skills and innovation development and higher education I think needs to recognize that it needs to accredit it and it needs to learn from it. So convene um, means to come, to come together for a purpose. Um, it, you know, the, the innovations, I suppose, and the agility in convene are coming from three places primarily. It's integrating a pan-university response to a sector need. So it's very much sector facing. And that's a really important distinction, I think, because if you're a tourism company with a digital transformation need, do you knock on the College of Business or the School of Computer Science or the Incubation Center or the Research Center or, or all of them or none of them? You know, that's, that's the first thing. Everything Convene will do is co-created with enterprise. So there's an enterprise partner involved in everything we're, we're doing. It's also embedded in our education, research and innovate, um, innovation mission. So everything is embedded in the curriculum um, on, on the education side. So I suppose four kind of key agilities then, um, the, the first idea is to develop a kind of a Velcro interface with enterprise where there's lots and lots and lots of small frequent interactions between staff and enterprise and staff and academia. Um, we're calling this the enterprise faculty and it's comprised of enterprise staff, um, maybe as guest lecturers, as mentors, as all the other things we ask them to do for us, working with academics, researchers and innovators. The second innovation is global innovation teams. Um, it's, it's bringing enterprise into our universities, embedding it in our curriculum. Basically student teams, international student teams from many disciplines working together on enterprise challenges with enterprise and academic mentors. It's a really light touch, low cost, low commitment way for SMEs in particular to engage with us. The third is accredited talent development. Um, if you're familiar with LinkedIn collaborative provision, it's, it's really an expansion of that. And it's, it's basically for us taking TU Dublin's reach out into enterprise and creating almost an enterprise campus. Um, so it's where we accredit an enterprise company, for example, to deliver a skill solution to other enterprise companies. So it's extending our reach that way. Um, the fourth then, and I, I think um, uh, UL at work have beat us to this, but um, it's, it's basically to stop reinventing the wheel because there's a huge amount of really high quality online commercial content out there that can supplement our deliveries. Um, it, it really should be freeing up staff to do the real value add of assessment and feedback to learners. So I suppose in summary, what does Convene do or hopefully will do soon? It's, it's really to translate between the economic sectors and our core mission. And there's a real challenge there, I think, um, between faculties and sectors. Um, it navigates what is a really, really complex skills and innovation um, ecosystem. Who's doing what, where, why, how can we connect the dots, join, join it up and bring back one solution to enterprise, not, not 40, you know. And internally, it will act as a sort of an internal incubator where staff can bring their ideas, work in a supportive environment, maybe for a semester, um, and, and then go back home to their, fa their faculties. So that's a whistle stop tour, really, and um, some contact details there. I'd be very happy to follow up with anyone. I would say one of the exemplars we're looking to is the way the National Forum organizes itself, because I think the ecosystem it has created around teaching and learning for higher education is, is phenomenal. And I'd be definitely um, knocking on Terry and Lynn's door to find out what the secret sauce was on that, you know. So, um, so thank you very much um, uh, for the opportunity to present today. And I'm sure we'd, we'd be seeing lots of each other over the, the next few years. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Deirdre. That was really excellent. And I, I love the idea of the, the Velcro interface between uh, faculty, staff and, and, and enterprise. Um, and again, just to thank all the speakers for packing so much in and, and, and being so uh, uh, succinct in, in doing so. Uh, I think Claire wants to come back in now just with a, 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 a general message to the, uh, to the, to the attendees. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Um, at this point, we thought it might be useful just to just to visit the Google document uh, very briefly. I'm not going to, to bring it up live on screen, and this will be very brief because we, we're going to move ahead. But I think, um, thank you, first of all, everyone for the contributions, uh, which are very rich in the Google document. Please continue to do that. 
And what's um, emerging is a sense um, actually of a lot of the themes the speakers have raised. But if I can put that into a nutshell in a couple of seconds, the sense that we have pivoted um, in terms of the pandemic, but that we might take that to mean a much wider set of changes that we can make, that we can reflect agility um, in terms of the effects of technology on our sector, the options that learners will want to have into the future. And as Lynn was saying, reimagining um, the positive disruption that we're going to see, which would have been coming along in, in any case, but which uh, has been accelerated by what we've experienced over the past year. So please do keep contributing into the, into the document. And um, I'll hand back to Jim now for the next part of our session. Thank you very much, Claire. Well, we've, we've heard, I think, Enterprise mentioned in, uh, in every segment and session of, of today's webinar. So uh, it, it, it'll be nice now to hear uh, the voices of Enterprise speak for themselves. So our, our, our two speakers are Dr. Kevin Marshall, who is from Microsoft Ireland, and Gareth Lee, who works for Screen Skills Ireland. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, good morning, and um, I haven't changed my my appearance. I've just gotten older and been away from the office, so <laughs> that's the difference. Uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to be here. Um, it's a very important discussion. Um, so just by way of background, I head up education at Microsoft, and that's why I didn't use a PowerPoint. Right? <laughs> so uh, I think it's safer. Um, our interaction and... Um, work with the HEI initiative at the moment. Uh, we are involved as an enterprise partner in um, four or five projects. So we are involved in the DCU undergrad curriculum transformation. We're involved in RCSI's um, pharmacy project. Uh, we're advisory working with Lynn uh, on some aspects of the micro credentialing uh, we are working on the Convene project with um, TU Dublin, particularly in Tala with Barry Feeney, uh, which is an ongoing long term collaboration and we're trying to uh, scale that up. And we're also working uh, in various in very smaller projects um, with UCC, on, particularly in the area of sustainability. So, um, and I think we're in, UC, we're in UCD as well with the advanced project. So we're, we're in the mix in a lot of these things and it's, it's, it's quite interesting as they get up and running, um, you get a real sense of the challenge, um, the challenge that, that uh, to change. And that's not just universities, that's also industry as well. Uh, I think the pandemic has accelerated um, a lot of this change and can do because technology had to play a bigger role than maybe was envisaged and some of these, uh, the tenders were due before the pandemic. So a lot of the innovation, some that's already happened. So now we get a, uh, an opportunity to go even further, which I think is a good thing. Um, and that's not without its challenges. Um, but I think um, just to step back for a little bit and go, well, what do we mean by agility, agility and what do I think of it and what, what's important from um, you know, an industry perspective? Uh, and I think it's not necessarily speed, uh, which sometimes is, is thought about as that do you do things quickly. It's more about, from our perspective, is able to manage continuous change um, in a volatile, complex and uncertain world. It's what we're right now. Um, and the way we prefer and like to engage across the board with academia is um, in constant dialogue about what we need, what you have, how can we work together and how do we co-create it? Um, and like a couple of examples that have changed in, in say the last decade or so, um, Springboard is and was a fantastic program of work um, over the last decade in response to the crisis in 2008. My question in our thinking about the micro-credentialing, for example, is that from a learner perspective, do you really want to spend two years in a HDIP? Is there a better way to do it? Is there a quicker way to do it? Is there, what's the balance between skill and learning? Uh, and I think those are important discussions and they're the discussions we're having in the micro credentialing because in certain tech ideas, um, not everyone would want to do a two year blockchain masters, for example, but maybe a 12 week as a, someone in a management level to get a handle on it 
as they're running teams maybe a way to think about it so i think that's really interesting that's really that's good but it's it's complex and we had a really interesting conversation last week um on the advisory forum and listen to the work in dcu which i think is is they just presented it was actually really interesting and they've a lot of thought there and i think that's a great model going forward um i think the other key thing about agile curriculum is this notion of assessment i think that's the one thing we do not do not what do not do well in this country and that's across the board and if i look at the leave insert and what happened last year and what's emerging now and what it's all about um we need to rethink that i think we need to rethink it in higher ed as well um and how that fits in to this kind of old triangle of learning teaching and assessment and what that means for the learner at any particular space over lifelong learning that's something i think we this project should grapple with because that's it's not easy it's uh it's complex but the old models of how we are assessing we need to rethink what they could be in a world where you have all this cool technology and could do different things and we could think differently about it and we could really reimagine the portfolio as learned experiences and things like that which i think now we can think about the other point i make is the notion of a distinction between learning and, and skills and this is the time point issue i mean you do want undergrads to explore all these great books and ideas as well as developing skills and i think there's a balance and we, and we shouldn't forget that you know it's not all about i want the best data scientist coming into my organization i want the best well-rounded guy or girl who can think and who's read lots of stuff and can apply those learnings to a particular problem across multiple teams across the world and what they will come into you know so i think we need to get that balance right um the other thing is that in some regards the universities at one level will never keep up with the emerging tech but i mean we can't keep up with the emerging tech to be honest so i think that's not really the way i would think about it the way i think about it, if we're in constant dialogue about what is actually coming down the line what we see what we need what can you provide how do we co-create that course or that learning module or how do we integrate that uh in a timely manner i think is is probably the way forward and i think that's the value in some of the stuff uh with the the micro credentialing um and the final point i'll say um is this notion of data and data literacy we really got to think about what that means and what we how we embed those particular skills in a way that we've never done before across the curriculum everywhere for everyone whatever subject you're doing and push it down into the leave and certain all that stuff but let's talk about higher ed that's something and given all the stuff that's going on with data and vaccines i think that's the better we are we're thinking about data the better we will we will be um so that that's i'll stop there i could go on forever um but thank you and i appreciate the opportunity to share some comments but we look forward i mean the only way this is going to work for the country is we do, we work in dialogue it, there's no other way and it, i think that's the one thing you know the good things out of the last 10 months or years that, that we we can solve these together and i think that's the important point thank you thanks very much kevin uh lots of food for thought there uh, it's a little bit reassuring to know that uh, Microsoft can't keep up with the technology, um, but uh, you, you make some very important points about assessment and, of course, the balancing the balance between learning and skills. Uh, so our, our, our final speaker today is, is Gareth Lee. So, Gareth, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so my name is Gareth Lee. I'm the uh, manager with Screen Skills Ireland and delighted to be here today to talk about agile curriculum from a screen sector perspective. Um, yeah, I only have five minutes, so I'm going to crack on. So, I think it's good to start with a bit of, because we're, we're coming from a sectoral point of view, it's good to start with a little bit of overview and context. So, um, Screen Skills Ireland is the uh, skills development unit within Screen Ireland, which is the development agency for Irish film, television, and animation. And through the skills unit, we support the sector in a variety of ways uh, through continuous professional development programs. So in 2020, we rolled out um, around 84 CPD programs to over 1,500 professionals. Uh, of those 84 programs, uh, they were all oversubscribed. Uh, only five of them were certified. Um, and, um, and, and, and that kind of uh, demand, I suppose, is, is constant. And we've seen that over a number of years. We also... Um, 
have a role in terms of oversight of Section 481 skills development requirements. So uh, through that role, every production in Ireland that avails of the tax credit has to submit a skills development plan to Screen Ireland for Screen Skills Ireland for approval. And through that plan, a uh, number of participants on the production or people involved in the production, their skills development um, progress is tracked across the production and quality assured at the end. So it's a really interesting um, work-based learning initiative that we're really involved in in this sense. And it gives us great um, insights into the, the skills needs of the sector as they're emerging um, you know, from, from the front line. We also, uh, as an organization, carry out our own research and analysis of sectoral skills needs, and we publish uh, an annual report um, in that area as well. In terms of a sector overview, there's approximately 12,000 people employed in the sector. Uh, the sector is growing and changing. Uh, it's more than doubled in size in the last 10 years. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 um, yeah, it's a, uh, you know, I suppose it's a sector that maybe um, we haven't maybe shouted about, you know, enough, I guess. The other thing to mention is there's over 300 roles in the sector. A lot of the time the sector gets seen as, you know, there's directors, there's writers, producers, but they're actually well over 300 roles and their roles in the creative area, the design area, business area, technical area and so on. And also as a sector, a lot of those roles are very future skills focused, um, you know, in the areas of kind of creativity um, communication and so on. So there, a lot of those roles are quite uh, immune to kind of automation in the same way as, you know, or, or, as opposed to maybe similar roles in other sectors. Um, we also, um, you know, a huge part of our work over the last few years has been about developing a more structured and inclusive sector. And a big piece of work that we're doing at the moment is a competency framework for the sector for all roles and, and we see this as a really important piece of work because it will help with um, access routes into the industry progression opportunities uh, but also it will influence kind of curriculum design and development um, from a CPD point of view but also potentially at the FE and, and HE level as well. Um, we uh, encounter lots of perspectives to our role uh, and I thought I'd share some of those today. Um, all of these perspectives obviously have to be taken with, with a pinch of salt, but these are the things that we hear most often. So I think it's useful to look at them and see if you know um, agile curriculum can maybe respond to some of these concerns that are raised. So employers often say things like, you know, graduates can't hit the ground run, run, running or there's a skills gap. And I think it's really important for us, and this is some of the work that we do, try to drill down on what that skills gap actually is. Is it about specialization? Is it about uh, transversal skills and so on? Also from the employer's perspective, we often hear that their experience of curriculum program development is frustrating. And I think that's often down to, you know, red tape or, you know, the amount of time it might, might take to get something certified or not having a single point of contact. Um, you know, those kinds of things seem to come up quite, quite regularly. From a new entrant, recent graduates perspective, the things we often hear are, I didn't realize this role existed. So, uh, you know, sometimes graduates just aren't aware of the, the amount of roles or how their skill sets might fit particular roles within industry. Within industry. Uh, they also say things like, I learned uh, so much in my first few months uh, as a professional. And I think that, um, that kind of intense learning that happens within the workspace is really of, of huge value. And, and I think the next point is interesting as well. We often hear, that modules and subjects that they felt were irrelevant maybe when they were in their the education environment actually became really quite relevant when they were actually in the world of work and, and maybe, you know, consideration around maybe within the work environment and through work-based learning, that's where those that type of content makes most sense, I think is something interesting to consider. And then from a professional's perspe perspective, uh, we hear quite regularly about, you know, people who've been in, this, in, this, in the industry, sorry, for a long period of time have built up huge amounts of skills and knowledge, but don't necessarily have any certification to, to show for that. Um, so just to finish up then, just some general observations about agile curricula, curricula from screen sector perspective. Um, first of all, I'd say there's a lot of quality provision already happening out there. The work that we do to, through Screen Skills Ireland, um, but other organizations like the Skillnet Networks and many others as well. And I think there's scope for that quality provision to be certified potentially through things like micro-credentials that were already referenced. But I also think that work-based element uh, dimension as well, there's a lot of quality work-based learning happening that I think is, is ripe for, for, for certification and quality assurance through, again, through micro-credentials. Uh, in terms of HE curriculum, uh, agile curricula definitely needs to be all the things that have been spoken about before, like flexible, responsive, but I would also argue there's scope there to link it more concretely to, to sectoral roles or groups of sectoral roles as well. Um, and then I think it's come 
before already, but Agile curricula, again, from our point of view, definitely needs to be more than just the what. It's also about the who, like a lot of the provision we provide and the reason why we've built up a credibility around the provision that we provide is that we use people from industry to deliver in particular instances where that makes sense. So, you know, who delivers, how it's delivered, uh, when and where, be that in the work workplace uh, or, or, or wherever. I think they're all really important questions to ask about curricula too. The other thing then just in terms of quality assurance, you know, do we need to re-examine what quality assurance means when you're looking at industry facing agile curricula? Is it different to quality assurance as it would be applied to, you know, a, a standard BA program or whatever? And then I think it's also been referenced a couple of times already, but definitely we, we would see it as a two way street. Employers can do more, uh, bring more to the table. Um, but I think there has to be a real, realistic expectation then on all sides. Um, you know, employers are very busy. So I think it's about making life um, easier for, for the employer in terms of their engagement. And I think where that happens, I think you'll find much better engagement um, and, and, and much more um, collaboration, I guess. So the last point is just, I do think there's scope for, for new roles in HE, uh, you know, industry education liaison type roles that link uh, industry and education together. Um, it makes complete sense that there would be, you know, singular points of contact um, where, where, you know, language difficulties or whatever are, are, are more easily dealt with and so on. And I just, you know, like finish up with saying, um, you know, thanks for, for uh, having me here today. Do you think it's really um, interesting time? I think there's you know, great potential in, in more collaboration between industry and education. And I think it can only really help empower students and empower professionals uh, in terms of things like lifelong learning. So that's it. I'll finish up there. Thank you so much, Gareth. Uh, it's very important to have that perspective of, of a, an organization that has its finger on the pulse of a, of, of a sector. And I think uh, there's a key role to be played by organizations like yourselves in this whole business of developing agile curricula, uh, because they, 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 they often know more than anyone what an industry in the round uh, needs. Um, okay, uh, well, I have failed miserably to keep everything on time, but anyway, we will, we will uh, move on to our panel discussion uh, straight away. Um, I'd like to thank again, just all the speakers for their very, very, very interesting contributions. Anne, Denise, Lynn, Deirdre, Kevin, and Gareth. Um, so um, will we start? I, I don't know what Claire, did you want to come in one more time to talk about the, uh, the ideas maybe for the next, uh, for the second session on, 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 on this topic? <laughs> Thank you, Jim. And, and um, it seems I don't need to draw people's attention because they have been contributing huge amounts into the Google Doc. So if I can just ask you to continue and you've already been addressing that second point. So please do continue and we can move on to, to our panel piece. That's perfect. Sorry, okay. <laughs> um, okay, I have a, a question actually, which are the, uh, really is addressed to, to Anne in the first instance. Um, it, so, uh, one of our, our attendees has asked about the integration of the blocks across the sector and, and would you well envisage coordinating this type of work uh, throughout all of higher education? Uh, it, it, an interesting question. Well, I'm, I'm not sure we could, um, because it's, but I think what we can do is we can pilot and we can, we can show models of how things can work and how things can work differently. Um, there are several universities across the globe who are doing this kind of block teaching and we they're part of our international panel. So I think probably the best thing we can do is that we can pilot and we'd be more than help, happy to, to work with other institutions who want to look at how it's working. It's early days yet though, I'd, I'd wait you know, un, un, until we've kind of a couple of years under our belts because I think one of the things that I like about the HCI funding is that We've got to consider it as an innovation fund. Sometimes in higher education, we're afraid to try things in case they fail. And I think that that's what I really liked about this is that we're trying things. And I can't put my hands on the heart and say, this is the perfect solution. This will work for everybody. But I can say we're going to try and we will come up with something a little bit better at the end of it. Hopefully a lot better at the end. Of it. Thanks very much, John. I have a question for, for Kevin. Uh, you talked about embedding data at all levels. Uh, one of our attendees would like to know, could you expand on that? Well, it, it, part of the work in DCU is the notion of a transversal skills and um, 
one of the key things is is data literacy. So fundamentals around what is data, how you use it, how you manipulate it, how you interpret that. Because we find that a lot of the graduates that some come in are not necessarily skilled to the level that we think they should be in areas like that. But I think it, it, it's it's a it's about putting a, a framework in place where you can access various different competencies around data and data literacy. And if you look at the EU competency framework around skills and profession for professionals on the ICT sector, there's models of that that you could just pair back. I think, um, but it's it's to be it, it's it's to be it's to be aware of it and go that we think that's a gap. I think that's a gap in the system. Um, and, you know, without getting into the notion of what, in terms of statistics and all that sort of stuff, but there, there's some basics that I think we could build into a, a modern agile curriculum that everyone could have some sort of base on. And I don't think that exists. And that was the point in the work with DCU was to level that across every degree. And then at least you, you know you have some foundation. If you get the assessment correctly, well, then you're okay. But the, I mean, you can't force everyone to do this, but you can at least try and get a base. And I think that's really, really important because I think the amounts of data, the AI stuff, the machine learning stuff, even to understand how, where all that comes from um, is really important because there's some massive fundamental assumptions in all this stuff that I don't think everyone is clear about. And I think we need, to, as a society we need to become better at that around digital policy blah 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 so the but the fundamental to me is let's start with data and build on it and there's loads of stuff out there by the way and the universities are very good at putting these courses together and have loads of this stuff but it's it's more a systemic idea how would we put that across you know twenty thousand kids that's um thanks very much kevin point. yeah no that's, that's 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 very helpful i i'm I, i'm conscious here that we we've kind of run out of road um, and there's a ton of questions uh, emerging in the, in the chat section um, but what we are going to do is we're going to harvest these questions and we will address them at the at the follow-up uh, webinar to, to this one uh, there's you know, I mean some of the questions are, are really interesting and, and you know we'd need a, a another hour I think to debate them you know the the, the notion of having an agile student for an agile Correct curricula and the, the the ethical implications of that and the expectations that students have and and how do how are students prepared for moving from their you know traditional expectations of of a curriculum to to this new paradigm? Uh, there's also uh, important questions arising too around you know the the quality assurance and how important that is for the credibility of qualifications. These are huge topics and we are going to need more time. So. Uh, I'm, I'm proposing uh, that we, we, we will bring the session uh, to an end. Um, uh, and uh, I would like just to hand over now to the Director of the Forum, Terry. Thank you, everybody. And, and it has been a very interesting session. And we knew it would be, and we knew we wouldn't get the conversation finished. So we'd always planned for this, for the conversation to continue. So just for everybody to put it in their diary, the the next webinar as part of our national series on the Agile curriculum is on the 23rd of June um, from 12.30 to 1.30. And we will be sharing, we will be asking other projects to actually share um, what they're doing, but we will also be continuing the conversation. We'll pull together the features that have been identified and we pull a structure around some of the questions and issues that have been raised to there to debate further at the next webinar. Um, and just um, just to tell you that that's on the end of June, but uh, Kevin mentioned the importance of assessment. And let's tell you that on the 6th of May, we're having the first of our uh, two webinars on assessment. Uh, the first webinar on the 6th of May is tackling the thorny issue of final examinations. What is the future of assessment of, of learning through final examinations? And what we hope to do is to share and debate the perspectives, the perspectives from a range of stakeholders. And um, the session I'm delighted to say will be chaired by Dr. Onion Yehe. She's the Registrar and Vice President from Munster, uh, Munster Technological University, and she's also a National Forum Board Member. So I would, I would welcome all of you to uh, attend that. I think it's going to be a very, very interesting conversation. So thank you to Jim for chairing um, so well. Thank you again to all our speakers. And I look forward to seeing you all on the 23rd of June, if not before, at the assessment webinar. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.